this is a really tough job and it's a, a, largely a thankless job. Why do you want to do this? Uh, I, personally, and I don't, know, I, I don't know what the other people's motives are, I'm a native New Mexican. I'm concerned about the future of New Mexico. I'm uh, very concerned about the last eight years and in particular what's come out about the last eight years and say the last two or three years. Uh, so I became more and more concerned as I saw this election approaching. Uh, I have a 10 year old daughter. I have three older stepchildren I've raised. Other connection, many other connections to New Mexico is from my family and, and friends. And I'm very concerned about the future of the state. And I don't want, I didn't want to see, and I still don't want to see eight more years of anywhere near this kind of administration. If you win, you'll be dealing with um, a legislature that has traditionally had a very antagonistic relationship with the fourth floor and is dominated by Democrats. How would you, um, how would you plan to deal with those legislators? Well, I'm optimistic. Uh, I've dealt, I, I'm an attorney. I've dealt with conflict for 25 years. I've dealt with resolving complex problems for 25 years, essentially. Many of those, we've had to go multiple paths and, and options to, to resolve problems. Uh, but I enjoy solving problems. I understand uh, pretty well uh, the options that are available when you're in a particular circumstance, whatever position I, I am in in that particular circumstance, what leverage I have, what, uh, where the other people I'm dealing with, where they're coming from. I try to understand their interests, their concerns. Uh, I've been involved in negotiating problem after problem after problem for literally two decades uh, with multiple interest groups, which is in, in, a, in essence what I see in Santa Fe. Uh, many of those have to be resolved uh, ultimately through a veto or the threat of a veto, uh, or many of those there's common ground that can be found with uh, discussion with uh, parsing out issues, taking smaller bites at issues. So I see a, a wide range of options. What's your strategy in, in terms of conflict <clears throat> negotiation before it comes to a veto? How do you persuade people to come around to your vision of things? Uh, I think uh, I, I think I would use the carrot and the stick, if, if you if you will use that you know over overused analogy. So there's always some benefits to negotiation for all parties that, that I think you can pull out and tease out of the negotiations. And there usually has to be some sort of leverage or some sort of uh, negative or veto or potential of a veto to, get, to try to get people to the point of where they're not necessarily happy, but it's something that they can live with and they can, uh, everyone can accommodate each other's interests. One of these areas in particular has to do with the oil and gas industry and pit rules. These are rules that would um, help protect the environment, but they are, would make business more difficult for the oil and gas industry. Um, yes. How do we negotiate trying to make, uh, to how to protect the environment, but also um, keep industry uh, engaged and, and alive while doing so? How do you approach that conflict? Uh, that's a that's an essentially what I've been engaged in for most of my career. Uh, in I'm, I'm an attorney in private practice. Many times I represent the business side. Many times I represent municipalities or or entities that might not be directly involved but still have a major interest in those kind of concerns. And and oftentimes I've represented people that are impacted by environmental uh, matters or environmental uh, activities. Um, so, you have to use science, in my opinion, you have to use science, you have to use economics, you have to understand the political dimensions, and you have to try to balance the environmental benefits with the economic cost. And when I look at the pit rule, and I'm familiar with the pit rule, it is essentially a, a law that sets up the, the requirement for pits to be created that are very similar to what is a typical municipal landfill these days, which is double lined plastic liner with, uh, which is more or less the most protective environmental type of management system we have. It's expensive, 
it's uh, very precautionary and for certainly for landfills it's ne it's necessary for many of oil and gas activities and, and drilling in many areas it's overly protective so we're adding several layers of protection with those costs where the environmental conditions at that location uh, don't require it and the benefits don't match the cost. So that, that balance, using good science, saying where might we need these kind of precautions, how do we identify those so they're also implementable, so you don't have to do lots of studies on each location, because we drill thousands and thousands of wells, and you don't want to do a have to redo it every time you, you drill a well. You want some broad guidelines that are based on these fundamental principles. Uh, and I think if we do that, we will end up seeing uh, the, the pit rule relaxed substantially, uh, repealed in many circumstances, and perhaps identify some, some special circumstances where it's appropriate. Environmentalists disagree, of course, saying that um, that this industry has for too long been able to pollute and that this rule is necessary in order to prevent that. Governor Richardson has been a supporter and the legislature has generally, um, well, fought bitterly about it, but. <laughs> well, the pit, the pit rule was not adopted by the legislature. It was adopted right. by the Oil Conservation Commission. Right. Um, they fought about repealing it. Yes. And they fought about uh, not repealing it. <laughs> there was a bill this, this session to repeal it. It was I saw the bill was very short though, and it was very very, perhaps too uh, one size fits all. It was, it was just a straight repeal. I think what's going what I would my administration would propose is go back through the the process quickly, revisit the the law, eliminate this uh, very broad sweeping change, and focus it down again on what is appropriate for the, the circumstances and what is, what, what is economically feasible and realistic for the environmental benefits that we uh, need, uh, but we don't need to overdo it. Uh, and we don't need, uh, in fact, one person asked me, shouldn't we do it anyway, was in, in a similar interview. Even if we don't need it, why wouldn't we do it anyway? That attitude is what drives the oil and gas industry out of New Mexico. We, the reason we wouldn't do it anyway is because it costs several hundred thousand dollars for very limited benefits in many circumstances. Speaking of the legislature and some bitter fights, we've seen over the past few sessions, uh, including the, the special sessions, arguing and debating over how to solve the state's budget crisis, which everyone agrees is a problem, but uh, very few agree on exactly how to tackle it. We've seen uh, so far a lot of cutting and uh, not that much uh, yet in terms of raising revenue and raising taxes. But if the budget crisis continues or worsens, um, in all likelihood we may have to look at ways to raise revenue in addition to cuts because we can't cut uh, everything. So how would you, what kind of methods would you consider in terms of raising revenue for this state? Well, a couple of things. First, I don't know that we've seen a lot of cutting. We actually saw a, a gross receipts tax increase at, to finally close the budget gap. And the, and the other thing we saw was the use of stimulus money the last two sessions to close budget deficits. Um, so. Uh, we had a proposal to to take 2,000 vacant jobs and eliminate them, which would have taken them off the payroll, out of, uh, out of off the government state budget. But th there were nobody; those were not jobs that that we were spending money on. Those are in, those are in the budget. Yes, currently in the budget, they are not. Uh, they are potentially capable of being ref refilled or or filled if they're not eliminated. So yeah, my understanding is there's those and perhaps an additional thousand more jobs that have been uh, emptied by attrition. And my suggestion would be to eliminate those jobs and, and actually look at the state jobs before we start rehiring and change the benefit package, perhaps change the entire compensation package for state employees. Other states are, do, are being forced to do that. So you downsize and when you start upsizing, you're looking at a different method of compensation. So your first choice is we, would be to cut state jobs and cut state employee benefits? No, that's, no, my first choice <laughs> would be the empty state jobs would be to eliminate them. 
So, uh, and then when you re, and this isn't current employees, future employee benefit packages, I think need to be made competitive. As an example, the term for retirement for state employees, if someone were hired two years from now, need, demographically and statistically needs to be longer than it currently is because we're accumulating huge pension obligations for relatively short tenures, 20 to 25 year uh, job uh, performances. Pro the private sector can't afford that. That's how most private sector companies have been tried to survive this recession is to um, look carefully at their, at their costs, employee costs, and try to reduce those. So that would be one. The second uh, major uh, way I think we need to deal with our state economy is to grow our economy, which will, will send revenues to Santa Fe. We need to, the, you mentioned the pit rule, but we also have other industries that we haven't allowed to, to grow or haven't um, assisted in growing. It, we need to look in a broad-based sense of growing the state economy uh, in the Rio Grande Corridor, in other parts of the state that have resources that haven't been developed. Uh, that will create revenue. So that, that's on the revenue side, it's frankly my preference and my first priority would be to, to to grow business, which will create local jobs, which will help local economies, but will also help Santa Fe and help the budget in Santa Fe. Looking at Arizona, we saw Governor uh, Brewer over there um, just this past week sign a new law about immigration, making it um, a crime to be an undocumented uh, alien, an undocumented immigrant in, in the state of Arizona. Um, and this would allow law enforcement to demand uh, papers from anyone in the state in order to prove citizenship. Would you approve of uh, or would you support a similar law here in New Mexico? Uh, I, I read the Arizona law this weekend. It has about five major provisions, uh, one of which is sort of like what you described. Not, I would disagree slightly with your characterization. It, uh, it reads, the law reads, that, that even to ask for, for papers, there has to be um, a reasonable cause or, or some type of reasonable suspicion. So it's not um, unrestricted. Uh, but the main part of that law that I, I think might be applicable to New Mexico is not that part. I, it is the, the piece, there is a piece of their law that when people are arrested for a crime, um, even a misdemeanor, even traffic violation, law enforcement is allowed at that point in time to ask about their immigration status. In New Mexico, we don't do that statewide and we have certain communities that don't do that based on local ordinances or, lo or local uh, protocol. So that piece of the law that allows when a, a crime is conducted, um, law enforcement officers to look into immigration status and then follow up on that. Uh, that I think New Mexico needs to, to think seriously about adding that tool to our law enforcement. They, there was st is still some discretion uh, and some, some judgment in the officers applying that. Uh, how that turns into what happens if that person turns out to be illegal needs to be addressed. Some of the or other portions of the Arizona law uh, I think are, are more appropriate for Arizona it wouldn't, and wouldn't apply here. There's several, uh, it's really a comprehensive law Arizona passed. But that particular one that allows, gives law enforcement that flexibility and makes it the state policy that law enforcement, when they're, they're doing their job and when people are breaking the law, they inquire into uh, to status, resident status. Uh, I think that is something New Mexico, unfortunately, is going to have to move towards because the federal government is not addressing this. Let me ask you a, a, some really short kind of questions on a, on a couple of different issues yes. uh, really quickly. Um, yes or no, should New Mexico give undocumented, continue to give undocumented immigrants driver's licenses? No. Okay. And quickly, why not? Because it attracts, uh, for one thing, because most of our surrounding states don't do that, it attracts uh, undocumented Ill illegals to New Mexico. Uh, secondly, it, it encourages uh, that illegal immigrants to come to New Mexico uh, in, a, in a way that I, I don't think we're prepared to deal with, the, with the social costs, the 
um, the financial burden that, that it places. So I think that's, that's a fundamental uh, uh, document that we do not want to be providing as a state. Domestic partnership. Is there a version of domestic partnership that you would support as governor? Uh, very unlikely. Okay. I, I had nothing I've seen. What I saw this session was way out of bounds. Uh, I think there are, are basic contract tools to accomplish almost everything that was in that act.